Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Jennifer Casper Todd. I am here for the ISTE Librarians Network, and I'm your co host for this evening's webinar. And, and with I am, me is. And I am Allison Mackley. <laughs> also a part of the uh, professional learning community here at the ISTE Librarians Network. ISTE Librarians Network is proud to be hosting this free webinar to support librarians everywhere. The ISTE Librarians Network has a mission to promote librarians as leaders and champions of educational technology and digital literacy. Our key mission is to provide a professional learning community where librarians can leverage technology, knowledge, and expertise to improve library programs, increase access to information, and foster strong teaching and learning environments in a connected world. Tonight, we are thrilled to feature our ISTE Librarian PLN winner, Colette Casanelli. Colette Casanelli is a library and instructional technology teacher at Sunset High School and the, uh, and the Arts and Communication Magnet Academy in the Beaverton School District near Portland, Oregon. She's been an educator for 30 years and has taught every grade level K through 16 as an elementary teacher, a K-8 librarian, high school technology teacher, and librarian. Colette loves living in the beautiful Pacific Northwest with her husband, Dave. She loves gardening, traveling, and hanging out with her family and two-year-old grandson, Owen. She's the author of one of the Digital Librarian series books published by ISTE, Inspiring Curiosity, A Librarian's Guide to Inquiry-Based Learning. Colette often gives professional development workshops for both library and technology conferences is, and is a member of the Oregon Association of School Librarians, OASL. American Association of School Libraries, AASL, and the International Society of Technology Educators, ISTE. She is a Google Certified Innovator and a co-founder of EdCamp PDX. And she's awesome. Uh, she's our PLN winner. You are going to soon realize why that is. This evening, we would like for you to get involved. Uh, We'll take questions and comments via social media. If you are using Twitter, please tweet using our hashtag, hashtag istelib, that's I-S-T-E-L-I-B, and we'll do our best to answer. The istelib team and uh, Colette promised to pay attention to the istelib hashtag this week for concerns or comments. As well, if you're signed into YouTube, you will notice that you can ask questions and we can pull them into the chat directly um, for Colette. So I think uh, over to you, Colette. I think Alice and I are uh, going to take a back seat and we'll let you take it away. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. It's a thrill for me to be here. I remember about 10 years ago, I was transitioning back into the library after being a technology teacher. And I remember going to ISTE and just going to every single technology and library session possibly just to kind of immerse myself back into library land after being out for a few years. So I just, ISTE has a special place in my heart and I'm very honored to be chosen as the ISTE Librarians Network winner for this year. So um, my goal today is to kind of share with you a little bit about my library. Actually, I should say libraries because I am now split between two schools, Sunset High School, which is a comprehensive high school of about 2000 students in Beaverton, Oregon and the Arts and Communication Magnet Academy which is a smaller um, arts focus school with about 750 students in grades six through 12. Um, anyway, this is a picture of my library at Sunset. I've been there, this is my sixth year now. And um, I just thought maybe one of the things that I could just talk about and maybe even you in the chat or those who are listening right now can even focus is like, what, you know, what have you had the most impact in your physical space? Because I know when I first showed up at Sunset High School six years ago, it was like this huge room with lots and lots of shelving and lots and lots of books. 
and not very much comfortable seating and a lot of old dusty books that had never been weeded. Um, they actually hadn't had any librarians for a few years in the in the district and they were hiring people back in this new role as a library and instructional technology teacher. So, you know, one of the first things that I immediately did was, you know, get to know the collection and get to know my library assistants and the and the and once I kind of felt like I was getting familiar with the the curriculum, I started doing a heavy, heavy weeding and getting rid of some of these freestanding cases that you see here in this area. Um, after the second year, I worked closely with a bunch of volunteers and my library assistants, and we genrefied just our fiction collection. And we also put in um, an Apollo Press Student Publishing Center, which I'll talk about in a little bit later. We finally got into a Sora ebook collection. Um, and really just trying to transform, making the library a center of the, of the community. And one of the, one of the questions I have for you is to always think like, how are you transforming your physical space to really match your vision that you have? And it was, I was very lucky that I had administration when I shared what I felt like my vision of the library should be. They were um, on board with it. And so I was able to tap into some resources with a parent PTO who helped donate some furniture. I actually got some furniture and some funding through places like Donors Choose and the Walmart grant and things like that. And um, so we were able to physically just change the look of our library and make it more student friendly with a lot of these little sections that you see here of seating areas around and really refocus the instruction of not just a place um, that kids come to hang out and check book, which of course I want them to, but also as a place for learning and it's the hub for learning of our school. And so on the other side, if you could look the other direction, there's a bunch of tables and instructional area, and then there's a computer area and much more seating too. But I'm really proud of the changes that we made. And I'm very much missing my library because I am still um, in Oregon here. We are still teaching remotely, 100% remotely. And so I'm missing my library space. I do have assistants who are uh, still uh, doing a lot of the inventory right now. And they are also um, doing a lot of curbside pickup. But I, my job as library and instructional technology teacher is more the instructional side of the library job. Whereas my library assistants at Sunset are doing a wonderful job, you know, taking book requests and, and turning, putting books by curbside pickup. My job is to work with the teachers and the students on research and reading, information literacy, book, book sharing, all those things. So one of the things that was really important to me when I first started is just to really infuse this idea of research. Um, at Sunset, we are a comprehensive high school that also has an IB international program in it. And um, and I this is only my second year at ACMA, that's the arts communication. But um, early on, I was a little uh, concerned when I first started and there were a lot of teachers not using our library databases. And so that was one of my first goals is to work with our district librarians and the LITS, that's what they call us, L-I-T-T, -T, Library Instructional Technology Teacher, the LITS and the other schools, and really develop this this uh, curriculum of research. We're really blessed in Oregon that our Oregon State Library provides a lot of databases to every public and private and school library in the state of Oregon. So we have a lot of the Gale databases that are provided through the state level. But then also teaching, you know, research and teaching evaluating sources. And over the course of the time, um, you know, I, I've used a lot of different um, resources to share, but I would say right now, um, our school, uh, especially our English classes, are um, you doing like a Penny Kittle type classroom library in the language arts classes. And then they're using Newzella for a lot of their nonfiction um, work. And then I'm bringing in a lot of the databases and we use the ebook collection through Sora um, to, bride, to bring a variety of fiction and nonfiction work. And so, as you know, this day and age is so important for us as librarians to um, teach 
how to evaluate sources, especially just think of everything that's been happening with the election and just teaching, um, you know, how to evaluate sources for credibility and authenticity and to really use those. And so it's been like a goal of mine to get into a lot of the ninth grade and 10th grade classes and just make sure that they have that strong foundation. Um, so, uh, question was, is Newzella free? There are some free features, but our school does have the uh, feature where they can connect the classes with our student information system. And so teachers can assign um, articles and then the students can read them at various levels. So research is a huge passion of mine. It's really hard to teach it when I am now split between two schools and also am doing remotely. I kind of joke that I am the the, the queen of screen casting, one of the things that I do often is that I have to, um, you know, duplicate myself. And so one of the things that I have done is that I just create lots and lots of screencast tutorials. And so one of the things that I've shared with my my both of my communities are all different types of screencasts on how do you access the library databases? How do you search? Um, EBSCO, how do we use these different technology tools? What are all the different resources? So I have been taking a lot of my um, screencasts and put them up on YouTube and created a, a helpful video tutorial page. And a lot of the teachers in both schools end up using that. So I guess that's a, a question, the question that I have for those of you who are listening is how, what resources are you using to teach uh, research right now? I mean, whether it's, it's websites or databases or programs like Checkology from the News Literacy Project, which we did the COVID um, lessons that they did last spring with all of our ninth graders, right? When, you know, all the coronavirus information was coming out and um, that they're, they're resources and they're all free this year. So definitely if you haven't checked out Checkology from the News Literacy Project, and honestly, I also subscribe to the SIFT, which is a weekly newsletter. And the SIFT is one of those things that every Monday they come with like, this is the news for the week and this is fact check and this is what's gone viral and why it's gone viral. And I feel like as a librarian and as an educator, I need to keep up on everything that's happening out there. And so if you haven't subscribed to the SIFT yet, I really encourage you to do it. They are excellent, excellent resources that have helped me as a librarian be able to work with teachers and students and help them teach them, especially about current event resources. One of the projects that I'm most proud of that um, was one of the things that was submitted for the um, for the ISTE Librarians Network Award was this collaborative project that I worked on with two history teachers from Sunset High School. It was our Reconstruction Museum. And we had been, I had worked with a lot of the social studies teachers before on various types of research, but these were juniors and we were really trying to think how can we give them more of an authentic experience of why, why do people do research? How do people share research? And um, so we sat around and brainstormed this idea of, well, we would like to maybe have a museum. Uh, the students have been watching the reconstruction series from PBS in their classes. And we're thinking like, well, if we do some kind of museum in the library, what, you know, what is the real work of museum curators? And what is, what is the real work of a museum? How can we duplicate that experience and have our students really feel like they are putting on their own museum? And so at the time there were four sections of, of the IB history class. And so we uh, kind of brainstorm with the students, well, what does it look like when you really go to a museum? Like who decides what goes into a museum? And some students had some knowledge and teachers and we talked about the role of a curator and a curator goes out and finds um, articles and information to display in their, um, in their uh, museum. And so we, uh, one of the cool things that happened in this experience is we had two students from each section run to become or you know volunteer to become the student curators at the reconstruction museum and so they had to apply 
and they had to give speeches in front of their class and they had to explain how they have leadership qualities. And so two students were selected from each of the classes. And that's what you're seeing here, This these kids standing in line here. And so the wonderful thing about the classroom teachers and myself is the classes would come to the library and the student curators were the ones who talked with the other students. And they would say, okay, you know, this class has been assigned these topics for our museum. And then they would go around and work from table to table and talk to them about their exhibit. And I would follow behind as the librarian and saying, one of the requirements is that all their exhibits had to be based on primary source documents. So we would work with them on how to find research and information about those primary source documents. And then, um, the once that the groups kind of had the basics of their research, the curators were like got together outside of class from the different sections and said, okay, like, what is this going to look like when we put this in our library? Um, and so these eight students would get together at lunch or they would meet with me or they would meet with the teachers and they would physically like plan out what the museum was gonna look like in our library. And so once the research component had been done, now the students were fig trying to figure out, well, what really makes um, a museum display interesting and interactive? And so the students had to figure out like, um, what component of the research was going to be displayed on their project or what was going to be interactive. And we required every student to have an interactive piece to their um, piece. And so some of the students used some technology tools like uh, Makey Makey and Hotspots and to like you would touch different parts of their museum display and different volume or audio would display or they would have maybe um, an iPad with videos to watch, or like in one of these, you see this picture here, this is a voting booth where the people had to go in and learn about voting rights back during the reconstruction. And then they had to practice doing voting. We had artwork that students had made sculptures and created like almost like little, um, you know, question and answers. You'll even see in this picture down here, we have some of the parents who came to our evening museum experience and talking about um, at, uh, flipping questions up and looking at the display and answering questions back and forth. Um, it was really one of those teaching experiences that, you know, the collaboration between the social studies teachers and myself and the student curators, and we held, a, an evening event where we invited families to come and walk through our museum. And there were films that students had made and community members came. And um, then we left the museum up in the library for the rest of the week and different social studies classes would come through the museum at that point too. And it was just such an, an amazing, authentic experience with the students. I just, I loved it. Okay, um, I had to add myself to the stream so I could ask you questions about this. That, I hope that's okay. That's fine. Um, so I, I love how student-centered this is. I just love the tactile feel of it. Um, if we were to try something like this in our own libraries, would you recommend we wait until we're, we're back into normal environments? Or do you feel like this could be in some way modified for a hybrid or um, the sort of blended learning model? Well, we actually, we were starting to plan the museum last spring, right when we all got sent home 100% virtual. So there is a link on my slide deck that actually talks about the virtual museum that the students did instead. We still did have student curators. They were still in charge and they just still assigned, but everybody's project ended up being some kind of digital project like through Adobe Spark video, mm -hmm. Adobe Spark page, maybe Wii video or Kahoots. They would play games. They would just use all the digital tools that we need. And what we did is we had a Zoom community night where the curators invited all the students and teachers and we they hosted an evening event. It was different. It was mm -hmm. still really cool, you know, to do the virtual event instead. Um, just the tactile part, you're like, you're right about the artwork and the sculptures. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the reasons we were able to do some of the, the creative projects 
I'm going to talk about in a minute is because of our publishing center that we put into our library. So um, we're planning on doing the Reconstruction Museum, Museum again next spring. And each time we're trying to still pull the kids, they're still so used to like making a poster board and having a bunch of artwork and writing on it. And we're trying to get them to really you know, really go to a museum and say, how how do museums entice and engage people in it, maybe through technology or other physical pieces? So And I guess you we'll could see. pull in you can pull in things like Google Arts and Culture just to get them right. like a 3D version of it. Okay. Well thank you. I love that. Yeah. I'll be quiet now. Even no, no, that's totally fine. I actually love it when you jump in because, you know, what was cool is some of the students who were like, we have a really strong computer science engineering program at our high school. And so we had students in the computer science classes who have a, an um, access to like vinyl cutters and 3D cutters on. And so they were building and creating models in their other classes. And then when you start kind of involving the art classes and the computer science classes mm -hmm. in the museum project, I mean, I was just so blown away. I, I love, love this project, mainly, like you said, because of the student leadership. Mm -hmm. Really, those student curators took on that project and really made it what it was. And I think the other students responded to it because even last spring when you know a lot of students weren't very engaged in school with you know we were all doing pass fail grading and all that mm -hmm. the reconstruction museum project was one of the only projects where students were a hundred percent engaged even though it was still all online so wow that's quite a testimony yeah mm -hmm. and um you know uh, it's it's just kind of cool to see them come together with the different classes. And I do have some blog posts that I wrote about it on my blog, EdTech Vision. And um, I'll, I'll put the slide deck and the links we can share on the uh, ISTE Librarians web page too. That would be awesome. Thank you. So I mentioned the Apollo Press Student Publishing Center. Um, about five years ago, a creative writing teacher want, came to me and said, hey, I have my kids make these little books, but is, do you know of any way that we can self-publish an anthology of our collection of our books? And so I did a bunch of research and we live in Portland, Oregon, which is home of Powell's Bookstore, the famous Powell's Bookstore. If you've never been to Portland, you have to come. And at the time, Powell's Bookstore had um, a self-publishing machine where you could send all your files and would literally like print and cut your pages and glue it together and spit out a book at the end. And so our uh, creative writing students uh, designed and compiled um, an anthology of their writing. And I worked with a lot of the students on the layout and the editors and getting it all to work. And then we took a field trip down to Powell's to watch our book be printed. And um, the coolest thing happened is that the manager of the bookstore invited all the students up to the you know, red room and they have set up their uh, lectures and tables. And he asked each of the students to come up and read from their piece of their writing and to sign their book because Powell's takes um, first edition, they have a collection of um, prize books that have been, um, you know, signed by different authors who come to speak at their book. And he wanted a collect, he wanted the kids book to be in this collection. I mean, I still get goosebumps thinking about it. And they were so proud. Kids who wouldn't speak up in class got up in front of the microphone and read from their part. And it was just one of those magical moments. And I was working with this, the creative writing teacher and I'm like, we need to do more student publishing. How can we recreate this experience in our own school? So we had a little room in the back of our library that the first year that I came just had a bunch of kind of furniture shoved back in there. And like one kid would open the door and sit there, but no other kids would go in there because they were too afraid to like disturb the older kids who kind of dominated the space. And I'm like, this is crazy. Like no one is really using this little walled off room. Like what if we kind of turn it into a publishing center? So I started writing grants, crazy grants. Um, 
I got one from our, we live, uh, our school is right next door to Nike in Beaverton, Oregon. And so I got a little uh, grant from Nike and donors choose and our PTO and Walmart and these different places, Oregon School Library Association ha had a little grant. And so we started just like collecting items to put in this room. We got a color printer, a 3D printer, a whole bunch of art supplies. Um, we got parents to donate just doodads of whatever, you know, cardboard and paint and all this different stuff. And so I started publicizing to the teachers, like for me, this was an equity issue that I wanted to make sure that every student had equitable access to materials. We can't just always start the project in class and then send them home and expect that they're gonna come back with a high quality project. You need to give time in the library, bringing them to the library, doing research, giving them the resources that they need so that you can work with them right there and then. And so I just started every class. I'm like, bring your kids to the library. We can use the publishing center. So a lot of people at this time were doing a lot of maker spaces in their elementary schools. But at the high school level, I felt like the publishing center was more in line with what our teachers needed. They needed places where kids could have a green screen where they could film and they needed a place where they could do stop motion studio. And so we just converted this room and it basically spilled out into the library. Um, and we just called it the Apollo Press Student Publish Center because our school mascot is the, the Sunset Apollos. And so we even made like a little logo and we, um, when people would publish different print and physical items or um, even we would try to like stamp it somehow or have them put it at their end. Um, and some students just blew us away like this picture of this beautiful book this this hand painted book the student hand stitched her own book together i loved all that kind of creative because that's kind of my like i'm i'm very artistic and creative but i love all that tactile like making projects and collages and things like that um so we uh, really just started to bring a whole bunch of technology pieces into it and also the digital arts pieces, which started to lead us, oops, I'm not gonna play this, sorry. To, oops, so um, to kind of like these publish, really focusing on what can you do in class and try to give our teachers an authentic audience where students could take their work and publish it somewhere. So we took a corner of the library and we made it, you know, the creative writing zine center. And whenever a student in class would make some kind of project, we would have an area where we could put copies of the student work to be, you know, saved and archived and they could come back 10 years later and we would have their zine that they would made um, and their um, you know, ninth grade English language arts classes. And so that was one of the, I had a couple language arts teachers who were really into informational writing or um, you know, writing to explain or these different types. And so we had students like write out their texts and then use kind of like that old fashioned cut and paste and do kind of all these fun collage things. And then we just photocopy them on the photo um, machine and students, each student would make like six or seven copies of their zine and they would give one to the library and one to our public library and then they could trade them with each other. And we're really lucky that in Multnomah County, our library actually has zines in our public library. And so some of our students even submitted their zines to be part of the public library collection, which now you can barcode and check them out. And it was just a really cool project. And so that kind of transferred over into more of the electronic over at ACMA, which is an arts and communication magnet academy. The students are really into arts and dance and music and sculpture and all different things. And so and they love graphic novels, especially the middle school students love graphic novels. And um, so we started doing more of a digital version of a zine, more like a graphic novel. And I taught the students like, well, what are the different aspects of a, a graphic novel with panels and captions and thought balloons and, you know, words, how do you tell the story visually and, um, so it was it was a great a student started getting one teacher did it with their whole class everybody made a graphic novel but then now teachers 
are offering it as a choice. So if you're learning something in science or if you're learning something in social studies, you could make a presentation, you can make a graphic novel zine, or you could maybe make a video project. And so now they're trying to give them those options. And I think the more that you as a librarian kind of have your hands in all these different, I always call it like my cafeteria of tools. You know, what are all, what is your best way you know, why did you choose a graphic novel? What is it about a graphic novel that lends itself so well to your particular project? And have the kids really um, establish why they chose the medium that they chose and why they felt like that was the best way to produce their information. And so now kids aren't just making, you know, a video because the teacher told them to. The kids are choosing to make a video versus or a zine or, a, you know, because they feel like that's the best way to convey the information that they have. And I think that's a really important aspect of trying to get students to, to embrace that authentic experience. And so I guess my challenge for people who are listening is how are you in your library? How are you sharing student work? How are you becoming that person or that area in your school that really you know, every time they're doing a project, he's like, oh, I want copies of that for the library, or can we bring that here? Because I think um, teachers and students both appreciate having their work shared. And I was just going to say, as I was listening to you, I think so much of the power of what you bring to this is that authentic audience piece. When students can publish for someone other than their teacher, um, it just brings so much more uh, value and a sense of pride to the work that they're doing. So I would say in addition to truly being able to demonstrate their learning in a, in a way that maybe isn't impeded by whatever tool that they're choosing because they have this choice but now add the layer of the authentic audience and and it, clearly it's it's doing wonders for your students well it's interesting um one of my teachers uh at the ACMA, at the arts communication. He's kind of a, I would call him a traditional old school English teacher, um, but he does like to do creative things with things, but he's not very tech savvy. And so when we went to 100% remote learning and I was you know, sharing at the beginning of the school year, different tools we can use, I started talking about Book Creator as an option. And luckily, you know, last spring we were able to use Book Creator for free or to use some of their features to combine books together. And luckily um, we really pushed hard at our district. Like if we are gonna go 100% remote, we, you need to give us the tools so that our teachers can give our students some experience using um, some tools that can have that authentic audience. So in this particular one, everybody did do Book Creator and they took the story of Beowulf, which is traditional old English um, poem and the class, let's say of you know 30, 35 kids, they broke up the poem into like five or six sections and each group was in charge of one section. But then what they were doing is they were taking the story of Beowulf and they were rewriting it in a new setting. So Beowulf in the 1960s, Beowulf in outer space. How would you rewrite the story of Beowulf at Chuck E. Cheese's? Yes, that was one of the ones. But the cool thing, because this is as an arts and communication, um, the students got to specialize in their area. So some students really worked on the visual art, like almost all of them did original artwork and then brought it into Book Creator. Um, they had to do audio soundtracks. So students would compose their own music to be in the background or in the background as the writer, the performer would use their theatrical performances and really read the story of Beowulf in whatever setting. And then you had that creative writer who would work with everyone, but they were the one who actually wrote it. And then you had kind of that technology person who pulled it all together. And these just were finished last week. And it was just amazing to see Beowulf, this story played out in all these different settings. And the kids, because this is an arts and communication school, they really, really had an opportunity to shine and how complimentary the students were to each other in the sharing of their project. And yeah, we shared some of them, you know, to other classes or to the parents, but how the students really acknowledge like, oh, you really, 
added to our project because of the way that you read the story, or you added to the project because of your artwork. And they all work together to really make something that they were proud. And I know group projects are hard. I mean, one of the groups, their techn technical editor kind of, you know, didn't really come through, but the students were able to kind of take some of their work and still be able to share it um, in a way that they felt proud of. And so that was kind of an interesting way to um, have the have the kids work together on that. And so I think sometimes as a librarian, um, you can, when you're working with teachers, you can kind of offer that new element to maybe a project they've done in the past and say, hey, would you, how would you consider this? Or would you consider this? And um, to try to just be there to support them with the, whatever the research aspect to it, but also maybe the technology. And that really is my role as library and instructional technology is to bring those two together. Um, Oops, I'm just sorry. Gonna sorry, bring sorry, in, sorry. Oh, sorry. That's okay. I was just going to bring in a comment uh, by Crystal Joyce, who's a librarian, who is talking about uh, using Book Creator with their ninth grade students with the short story Lamb to the Slaughter by Roald Dahl to express irony and how much fun it is. So thank well, you for sharing it's, that. It's one of those tools that you can actually pull in so many different um, you know, you're really playing for the platform and you can bring in images and you can put video in there and you can put sound effects and, you know, you can bring in other projects that you make and other things like you can make stuff that you make in Adobe Spark video, you can embed into Book Creator. It's amazing what they can do. So I also love doing, um, I, I'm really, I, for years and years will be, I'm a Google certified innovator. And so I've really latched on to a lot of the Google tools, but the Google Earth and all the different things, it's always just one of those tools that really engage so many students. I mean, which kid doesn't love opening up Google Earth and zooming in and finding their house or their school or whatever. But um, I was had the opportunity to go to the Google Geo Institute many years ago and started to learn all about their creative and their I call play space storytelling tools. And the first one that we used a lot was Google Tour Builder, where students would go in and be able to put a marker on a map and write a little story and put a picture, but it was, it was their own individual story. And so now, if you haven't used the new Google Earth for Chrome, you have the ability to do those kind of digital storytelling right in Google Earth, and now it's collaborative. So you can save your stories right into your Google Drive and you can share your stories just like you would share any other Google document. And you can have multiple students writing stories in Google Earth and putting their locations on there. And so I've done a bunch of training on this. Um, I actually love the Voyager stories that are built into Google Earth from partners like PBS and Nat Geo. They're great resources, even as a librarian. I had a teacher who was studying um, Africa and um, the different land forms and where you could grow things and you couldn't. And I said, hey, have you taken your students into Google Earth for them to go look at these locations? And my, by the way, PBS has like this, you know, this story that can go along with it. And so I just love the combination of geography and storytelling and visualization. And honestly, the teachers who have embraced this the most at my school are my world language teachers. <laughs> they love using, you know, having their students speak in the language that they're learning and put dots and place markers in the map on the different location. And um, I don't know, I just have a bunch of resources here, like just getting kids to be familiar with Google Earth by playing bingo games. And um, I have like a picture here, this actually picture here in the in the Zoom is a picture of my dad who was born in France and his, the town that he um, grew up in was actually almost completely flattened during World War II. And this is what it looked like in World War II. And this is what it looks like today. And so even in the Google Earth stories, you could take primary source documents from a historical time period and put it in and compare, this is what it used to look like. This is what it looks like now. And I just think you can go ahead and zoom all the way in and do the, um, the uh, street view and it's just amazing. I just love it. 
And there's, I have a, a link down here to a story that was written in a different language. And I, I just love embracing all those Google tools. Um, and that kind of is an, another thing that um, kind of one of the things that we did when we did the museum is these interactive posters is how do we engage all kinds of kids? Yes, we have the kids who love to read and and to do research and do, do art, but what about those techie kids in your class? And so we brought in, I don't know if you can see in this picture, but this is a makey makey in a, um, that's using a, a board where you actually push like um, brads, like metal brads in through the poster board. And so when you touch the metal brad, it connects to the makey makey, which connects to the computer. And then when you touch it, you hear the audio of the kids talking. And so now we've done using the programming language of Scratch to make not just traditional posters anymore, but now we're doing interactive posters. And uh, it's just been a great way, like those kids who love to code, who love that programming aspect of it, or who love the engineering aspect of figuring that out, when you put that in a group now, now you're kind of, um, addressing all types of students. And I think as a librarian and somebody who's talking with teachers, I think that's something you have to ask every so often is like, are we always just giving uh, kudos to kids who can perform or who can speak or who can do art? What about these other types of projects that might bring in other types of, you know, learning styles or you know, give the students who are the, the coders in the class a chance to show off their skills using their scratch programming and the makey makey. And it's pretty simple. I mean, we did it on the Great Gatsby and every single group was able to like, take this project about the Great Gatsby and make it interactive in a language arts class. It was pretty fun, actually. And so I guess one of the last things I want to talk about besides just, you know, working with classrooms on research projects and technology projects is just to promote that culture of reading at your school. So when I first started at Sunset High School six years ago, I immediately like created the hashtag Sunset Reads and working with our language arts department, we, we try to push in. At one point, our schedule had this weird, awkward kind of study hall time. So we try to get everybody to do all school reading. Our, um, our language arts classes were adopting the teacher's college program with Penny Kittle to have classroom libraries. And so when I uh, genre by the fiction collection with color codes, the, uh, the high school classes also use those same color codes on their genre collection in their classroom library. And then last year when I moved over to ACMA, it was the same thing. I really wanted to push like the ACMA reads. Like we all read, whether you're an artist or a sculptor or a dancer, like we need to really be embracing this creative school with all kinds of digital and print um, books and, you know, sources in there. And so we, you know, we kind of kind of come and go on our social media, our Instagram page, we have ACMA reads and one of my LMAs is doing a good job of, you know, getting people to share her. Uh, and, but mostly it's just kind of how do we continue to promote this culture of reading? And we have like little signs by each of the teacher's classrooms. You know, what are you reading right now? So that the kids know that the history teacher continues to read just as much as the art teacher does, as much as the drama teacher does. And just I'm always constantly trying to find little ways that we can promote reading at our school. And we have a wonderful collaboration with our public library who get, donate a lot of their extra books to us. And so we have books that say, um, well, shoot, I, I thought I had one in front of me, but they'll have a book and it will say Sunset Reads on it. And we put them in every single classroom in the entire school. So there are Sunset Read books in the science rooms, in the French rooms, in the PE rooms, everywhere. So we're really just trying to immerse ourselves. So if a kid's sitting there in study hall and they have nothing to do, that teacher goes, hey, I have a collection of Sunset Read books here. Do you want to read them? And so that's been a great collaboration with our, our, our partner library. Um, and so a lot of people always ask me, well, what is my like technology toolkit? What are the tools that I share? Now our school is, our district actually 
um, they, they are really strict about which tools we can use. They go through a whole vetting process to make sure that when we, our kids sign up for accounts, their data is not being, you know, you know, given away or sold some third party. So there are some tools that we would normally use that we are not allowed to anymore, but this is kind of like our technology toolkit of a lot of the Adobe Spark tools, WeVideo, um, Canvas is our learning management. We did get Book Creator this year. Of course, the whole Google suite of tools, and then just some other ones like Newzella and things like that. Um, but it's not that I'm not, uh, you know, against, you know, Flipgrid or anything like that. It's just we decided just to kind of focus on a certain set of tools that we are going to support with professional development and lots of work. And so when a, a student is offered a project, they probably have already been introduced to WeVideo or Adobe Spark page or, you know, something else because they've done it in another class. So I thought this would be a good time to see if there's any questions or anything that people would like for me to expand upon at this point. All right. So um, is there anyone who would like who has a question? Look, look for it in the chat. Do you also I have a question? <laughs> do you also have Canva premium or, or do you um, for your students or for, for education? How does that work? No, um, we don't. Um, I'm pushing to make it happen right now. A lot of the just the teachers are using Canva. I know I use it a lot for promotional stuff, but uh, yeah, I think they do have Canva for education. There's still limitations, but you know, it's hard. Like, of course we would love to have the paid version for a whole bunch of tools just because then you can be more assured that your students' data is not being resold and repackaged out there. But that's just one that I, as a librarian, I use a lot for uh, promotional act promotions for posters and what's happening in the library or put things on social media. Um, I kind of run the social media from the library point of view on both of the schools. But you know, like that is somebody, I think early on, that was one of the questions somebody said, it's like, how do you split your time between two schools mm -hmm. and these jobs? Well, it's challenging. Um, I think what the the challenge is that I do do a lot of, so somebody says, hey, Colette, can you come and work with my ninth graders on Monday? And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm already scheduled to work with somebody else, but can I make a screencast video for you? And so I do that a lot. I'll make a lot of like, hey, sorry, I can't be there today, you guys, but um, you know, your teacher is gonna teach you to go into opposing viewpoints database today. And let me give you a few tips and tricks. So I do that a lot. I make a lot of asynchronous videos that teachers use in their classroom. And I also feel like my job is to ensure that a lot of the research skills and the technologies being used, I don't have to be the one to be teaching it. Once people, you know, teachers get to a point where they're feeling comfortable, I usually just check in with them and say, how's it going? Do you need any help? And um, do a lot of background, you know, support or um, with remote learning now, I do offer open office hours where students can pop in and they can get help with their citations or if they need help with the technology. And we'll do sometimes do small groups. And uh, I do that a lot with the breakout rooms now. Um, if I come into a classroom, they'll put me in a breakout room and say, okay, who wants to work with Mrs. Casanelli during this mm -hmm. time right now? And I actually love that. That is actually, uh, it's been really good to kind of have that one-on-one -on -one time or small group time. I feel like I can give some really specific direct instruction or, or you know, clarify or, you know, students are like, oh, you know, what's the password to get into the, <laughs> the databases again? I'm just like, okay, let's start back from scratch, right? <laughs> Yeah, and, um, there is a comment here, a great idea when you're stretched thin and can't be in the classroom with the teacher and uh, thanking you for the tip. And I was thinking as you were talking about that, it's not only a way to survive and thrive, but it also shares the leadership 
leadership, your point about control, right? Like, like what, what do we, at the end of the day, we want our students to be readers. We want our teachers to feel empowered. We want everyone to be able to use the uh, resources and the platforms that we've shown them. And if, if, if they are ready to take that on their own, that's awesome. There's going to be someone else that you can assist, right? And then you build Always. capacity, right? We're leaders in our schools and, you know, leadership is sometimes about shared leadership too and building capacity so i love that um so much um linda is another asking, I'll, 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 I'll just a minute i have one more along that sign is like i'll have like one teacher who i'll work a lot with in one particular department and then they're they're the ones who say oh and they'll ask well how do how are you teaching this and they're like well i had colette come and work with my kids and she made this video for me and you can use it too and so that's one way just getting your you know the teachers who will work with you they're the ones who advocate for you with the other teachers it's a great way to like just share kind of non-threatening like oh well here's a screencast that she made for me maybe you and then pretty soon they start coming to ask for help too well, you've already answered part of what Linda's uh, asking. Do you have any tips to reach out to teachers for collaboration? And that was I, a great one. <laughs> yeah, that is a good one. I think it takes time. I remember, I vividly remember about 10 years ago, being at ISTE in a group of all the ISTE librarians and we were having like an unconference session. And Joyce Valenza said, it takes five years to build your library program. And I remember just thinking, oh my gosh, thank you for saying that. And it does take time. I mean, and every year I kind of like, okay, I feel like the ninth grade social studies teachers, they're doing really well. I'm gonna turn and focus on health this year. And you just need to like first give yourself grace that you're not gonna be able to work with everyone ever all the time, but you can be really strategic in who you work with and how you work with them. And one of my favorite things to do is I'll go sit and um, I, I'm blessed to have library assistants who can manage the library when I'm not there. That's the only way this job works. And so I can leave and go teach in a classroom or I can pop in to second lunch with the, the world language teachers. And I'll sit and have lunch with them for a little while and say, hey, did you see what these social studies teachers did in Google Earth? I think this would work really great in your French class. And so kind of that cro cross collaboration be between the different departments. But it is, this is, you know, since uh, because I've been there six years now, I have a lot stronger collaboration with those schools than the other school where this is only my second year. But you know, it just takes time and you just have to be helpful, not too pushy. Um, and just what can you take off their plate? What can you do to make them look good? And I always, always, always compliment the teachers to the principal. That's one of the things that I just think is super important and to showcase the kids work to the parents and to the community too those are really great tips as well we have someone asking if you have instructional videos that are available to share yeah i'm happy to now if you search my name on youtube you'll probably come up with a whole bunch of old ones <laughs> but i can i'll grab this um i'll grab this one and i'll put it in the chat Oh, can I, how do I do that? <laughs> do I have to put it in the private chat? Uh, sure, you can put it in the private chat and I can. Put it and there. then you can share that out. Sure. Um, you can share that out. So that's, that's some of the helpful videos that I've made right now. Some of them are real specific to um, a specific lesson that a teacher's doing, but I put them out there anyway. And I even have some fun ones that I've done like, um, I put myself in a green screen inside of a book. So you open up the book and I my head kind of pops out and then I talk about the book. And so I've played around with some of those techniques just to show teachers possibilities of kind of fun, creative things that they could do with green screen and we video or things like that too, so. Thank you so much for sharing that link. And I think we have time for one maybe final question or a comment.
Well, I have to tell you, you know, when you have had a really long month and you're just like, oh, I can't do this anymore. You have totally re-energized me. Um, they, like all of your, your uh, reconstruction museum, your publishing center, your zines, all of these ideas have just started my mind turning about um, what are some of the things that I can implement. I mean, obviously I can't do all of it, but what is one thing that I can do um, in order to help students have a more authentic audience um, to reinvigorate and re-engage? I think we all really need that right now. So I can't thank you enough on behalf of the ISTE Librarian Group. We're so grateful um, to have you have to have had you here to share. Um, those of you watching, you can see why Colette was the person we chose for the PLN <laughs> award for sure. Um, if you registered for this webinar, please know that we will send a follow-up uh, email to you with this resource. Uh, do look up uh, Colette on Twitter at CC C. Casanelli, and uh, her blog is edtechvision.org. I, I blog occasionally. I'm not super great at keeping it up, but whenever I have a big project that I usually share, I usually do a write-up of it, mainly for me, for my own reflective process, and also just to kind of get those resources out there to be shared. And and um, I think that is one of the, the cool things about working between two schools now is that I do, I can talk about the Beowulf project and I can go to the other school and say, hey, this language arts teacher did something really cool over here. And I, I, I'm with a lot of people, I'm really missing my library space and all those tactile hands-on projects right now. But I, at the same time, I think we're also fine tuning and doing some uh, interesting creative, you know, trying to do some interesting book projects right now. Definitely the kids are all reading on their Sora ebook collection like they never read before. So, you know, there can be, there can be really benefits to this kind of force, you know, into the digital world. And um, some teachers are discovering all kinds of accessibility tools that make it easier for kids to listen, to speak to, you know, speech to text and different tools like that. So, you know, um, it, it is, but I do think it's kind of a fine balance there. But I, this space right here, my little, publishing center. I miss that. <laughs> I miss oh, that because no. I, I love doing that kind of stuff. I love going back there at lunch and I have a group of kids hanging around and I'm like, hey, do you want me to show you how to, you can stitch your own book together and we'll just sit there at lunch and hand stitch a couple books together for fun and, uh, you know. I love that. I do want to add that um, if you follow ISTE Lib and you go to the people, um, I have to tell you that there are so many uh, teacher librarians out there that are sharing the good stuff that they're doing all the time. I know I gather resources from others on Twitter, um, on our Facebook page. There's just no end to the generosity, the generous spirit. So if you're looking for videos, um, you know, one of us will have some for you as well. So do reach out and share um, because we really are better together. So on that note, have a great night, everyone. We'll hopefully see a few of you at the ISTE virtual conference and please stay well and stay safe. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here.